I am an artist who tells stories. I walk across stage and screen. I am from Greece, and I moved to London eight years ago. Working in the British cultural industry is <laughs> challenging. <laughs> so I got a day job in education, teaching acting, writing, and directing at conservatoires and universities. My aim in both my teaching and my art is to connect with people, students and audiences, so I can actually meet their learning and entertainment needs and help them develop. My experience as a foreigner trying to connect with British students and audiences led me to a discovery that profoundly changed my understanding of why parts of the population are disconnected from theatre. When I first came to the UK, my foreignness was a problem. I struggled to grasp what was common sense to the groups I was trying to engage with. For example, on my first day teaching an undergraduate class in the southwest of England, I said something that sounded like, we will work on monologues from Shakespeare. The students, yes, couldn't stop laughing. Because of my Greek accent, I accidentally made a sexual joke. Greek people wouldn't have laughed because to them it would be common sense that the poet's name is pronounced Shakespeare instead of Shakespeare, which I'll never pronounce perfectly, but at least the sex is out of there now. <laughs> the linguistic common sense was just the tip of the iceberg. The sociologist Pierre Bourdieu uses the term habitus to describe how individuals develop a sense of cultural codes, things like manners, gestures, and ways of behaving. A habitus is a set of dispositions that we get from our family, schooling, and culture. It's how we know what is expected in social situations. The more homogeneous the group of students was, the more I looked like a misfit. And because they students, the more they shared a habitus. The worst thing for me was this shared habitus of all cultures about what makes a good teacher. The good teacher is a specialist. They know what they are talking about. They don't make mistakes, and they don't make a fool of themselves. My foreignness undermined both my teaching and my art because it made it extremely difficult to connect with students, creative crews, and audiences. I didn't quit. Instead, I used my awareness about how crucial this set of codes was for legitimizing myself as an artist to my advantage. The university was an ideal environment to familiarize myself with the habits of English-speaking audiences. So I saw my teaching as a process of exchange. I offered my expertise and knowledge of the subject, and in return, the students offered their expertise and knowledge of their culture. And within this exchange, I realized accidentally that the part of my habitus that was the biggest barrier for this connection had nothing to do with my foreignness, but with my taste. I discovered that during my first year of teaching, I gave a lecture on new technologies of or, or on stage. Uh, I used examples uh, like the opera Le Grand Macabre by La Forest del Baus, Infra, with the Royal Ballet at the Royal Opera House, uh, motion capture, uh, a deviate video, physical theatre, virtual worlds like Second Life, and a Brecht-inspired cyber performance that I was part of. When I presented my examples, I invited examples from the class. A student, a black woman, showed us Beyoncé's performance of Run the World Girls at the 2011 Billboard Awards. The example of multimedia stage was more spectacular, imaginative, and affecting, and more meaningful. Not only because Beyoncé is a black woman and the song a feminist song, but because the Billboard finalists are not nominated by specialists, but they are based on album and digital song sales, streaming, radio airplay, tour touring, and social engagement. The sole criteria is how many people around the world like a song, an album, or an artist. Young people make a difference to the selection, which is rare. My examples failed, not because most of the creative crews and performers were white men, 
even if the performances were full of a diverse range of people, still, nobody else in the room would have heard of them. I was teaching performing arts students in a small English town, and I chose opera and classical music as my examples. I obviously thought that motion capture and virtual worlds were cool enough to be appealing to the youth, but when it came to music, my examples weren't cool enough because they didn't represent the music taste of my target audience. Uh, the students couldn't see themselves in the examples and they couldn't see them as relevant. I wasn't cool enough because I couldn't see that the artworks that I chose symbolically led the students to pretend that they liked music that they didn't and also to grow up liking it. But why didn't I? When I was presenting my examples to the students, why didn't I choose artworks that would inspire them and motivate them to learn? Did I really like classical music so much? As Bourdieu suggests, my taste was learned from my family and my education. I was taught what kinds of shows are supposedly more valuable than others and what kinds of music are legitimate for a university class. It's what Bourdieu calls high taste and low taste. The students also shared the same dispositions with me. That's why they felt they had to, to stay. I shared dispositions about high art, which none of us was enthusiastic about. None of us really liked was a barrier to our connection. That realization not only saved all my later students from elitist misery, but also helped me develop as an artist. I realized that I had to cool up and connect with the youth. Otherwise, my art not only would not serve the needs of the audience of the future, but it would also put them off and contribute to killing theater altogether. How artists struggle to connect with their audiences is a big concern in the UK art sector at the moment. Because when theaters have a problem engaging the, with their audiences, their sales suffer. Theaters are struggling to reach out to the parts of the population that don't like theater and don't go to the theater, including the youth. But why don't people go to the theater? Quantitative research has failed to provide a concrete analysis of the complex motivations of theater audiences. It's self-explanatory though. The people who don't go to the theater, they don't feel it serves their needs or develops them for the future. It therefore alienates and excludes them. As a foreigner, I was able to see that one of the things uh, in the UK at the moment that makes young people to feel disconnected from theater and other areas of social life, it's that their taste is not valued enough. Addressing taste could help reaching out to them. I don't mean addressing the taste of the youth and change it. I mean exactly the opposite. Focus on the taste of those people who are usually responsible for teaching the youth to develop a good taste for high art forms. These are people usually uh, in, in, in leadership roles. Um, uh, not only arts leaders, but uh, teachers, parents, and everyone who makes a decision about a young person at some point. So I would suggest that anytime we take on a leadership role in life, we, as, as, as any good leader, we want to connect with the group that we lead and be inclusive. No matter who we are and what we do, at some point we try to engage with someone, a romantic partner, a child, our family, our workmates, our uh, classmates, our clients, and it was difficult to see where they are coming from. And all of us at some point have listened to someone that is trying to connect with us and thought, I see where you're coming from, but I don't think you get me, so I'm not going to engage any further and disconnect it. And in both cases, the reason why we all uh, wish we had connected is because we want to belong with people, live with others and share life. It's our natural instinct. So if the people we want to connect with are young people, then we naturally want 
to cool up. This cooling up process had three stages. Why, what, and how? Why am I not cool? The first thing to do when you're pro you tar we target a new group is to interrogate our own bias. We might unconsciously put people in a box. For example, do we make assumptions like this person will probably hate classical music and love hip hop and dismiss them or adjust our style accordingly? Such a disposition is at its worst with children's theater. Artists put children in a box and parents put children in a box. That's why they take them to see children's theater at the age that they don't really have any other choice. A good children's show, hello, <laughs> a good children's show would be liked by people of all ages. There isn't, there aren't only, it's not only children and carers in the auditorium for Matilda, The Lion King, or School of Rock. These are inclusive shows. Similarly, young people also like uh, shows that are made for adults, like The Woman in Black, uh, Stomp, and a comedy about a bank robber. So really interrogate, why aren't we cool enough to realize that the best show is an inclusive show? We're looking for our audience, our people, and we forget that there are things in life that are enjoyed by everyone, like uh, the sun, uh, flowers, uh, cat videos, and nice meals. <laughs> if we can't enjoy what children, young people, and other shows and groups enjoy, we can't connect with them. But why don't we do it? Because our learned taste has programmed us to belong with certain people and exclude others, and that's not cool. But now that we know why we're not cool enough, uh, we need to learn what is cool now. All we need to do is listen to what people uh, say about how f if they feel and what they like. But because expressing feelings is not very common in this country, we need to be careful uh, not to miss opportunities <laughs> like the one I will describe now. On my first day on a university drama degree, I was introduced to a fascinating first year cohort. My colleague announced that the students for their first year, they would devise a theater piece, but it needed to be an adaptation of contemporary, uh, a contemporary adaptation of a Shakespeare play. When the students heard this, they made a unanimous sounds of disappointment, like, ah. Oh. My colleague's response was, you can't be an actor in this country if you don't like Shakespeare. Sh Shakespeare. Guess what the curriculum had in store for them for their second year? <laughs> More sophisticated devising on a different Shakespeare play. This time, even the source uh, play was picked for them. By now, the students knew that they, uh, they, they, they shouldn't express their feelings about Shakespeare because no matter how open-minded the university might be, it still maintains some traditional attitudes to what Shakespeare means for this country and its theater industry. What if? we had listened to this collective sound of disappointment, we would have learned what is cool now from the source of coolness, the youth. We would have learned what the audiences and the artists of the future like. When the youth are loud about their taste, it's an opportunity of a lifetime. But acknowledging why we're not cool enough and, what, and learning what is cool now is not enough to cool up, we also need to take on the coolness challenge. To keep up with what young people like, I bought a TV. I put four music on in the background when I was doing the housework. The more I listened to uh, a pop, hip hop, uh, R&B and dance, the more I liked it. The more I liked it, the more I got into it, and the more I instinctively used it to inform my teaching and artistic practice. I transformed from a pretentious and elitist postmodern artist to a bubbly postmodern comedy writer. The fact that I'm still postmodern indicates that what I liked before 2010 is still in my work, but alongside other things that often seem contradictory, but somehow my inclusive taste makes them match. My work now clearly prioritizes entertainment which is the reason why most of the people go to the theater. 
But the stories that I tell aim to have a positive impact on society, which dovetails nicely with this other reason why people go to the theatre, meaningfulness. My efforts to include young people made my work more entertaining and more meaningful. But my work is not the perfect example. The perfect example of how an inclusive work can engage broader audiences is the hip-hop musical Hamilton. Lee Manuel Miranda's work about the historical figure Alexander Hamilton and the American War for Independence won the Pulitzer Prize for Drama and 11 Tony Awards and found huge commercial success, even making it to the billboard. Its biggest success is that it promotes the value of youth culture. Its combination of rap with Broadway ballads and Britpop is groundbreaking because even audiences with the most omnivorous taste tend to exclude rap. Rap and hip hop reflect youth culture. Miranda cleverly even has King George III aspire to rap by trying to freestyle. He fails and makes a fool of himself. But the young people know that he values it and they will come back to the theater and look for more of it. Mixing tastes uh, will help include people rather than exclude them. An inclusive leader can bring together different generations and social groups by keeping them hooked. Young people will make suggestions to the inclusive leader and they will stay hooked because they're waiting for a response so they connect. Holding on to that connection, the inclusive leader reaches out to all their generations and invites them to experience the coolness of the youth in small steps, one image sequence at a time. Don't take yourself seriously as you're trying to connect with so many people at the same time. Celebrate the fact that you took the risk and were prepared to fail. And don't get comfortable with the first cool thing that you discovered. Keep cooling up and yes, engaging wider ranges of people. You look ready to cool up. <laughs> Acknowledge why you're not cool enough and why you need to leave your comfort zone and try to engage and connect uh, with more people. You are ready to take the risk and invite someone to teach you what is cool now, you keep trying and failing because you acknowledge that coolness is a fluid state. So maybe during break, go and find someone and ask them what was the latest cool thing that they did or so. Keep a note of it and when you go home, make the commitment that you'll try to cool up.